Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yulia Panfil. I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America, and we're so thrilled to have you with us today. We know that approximately 1 billion people globally have insecure rights to their land and homes. But we also know that despite the proven benefits of land and housing documentation, governments across much of the world have failed to provide this service. Over the last decade, non-governmental actors, in particular private social enterprises and nonprofits, have emerged to alleviate this bottleneck and deliver land registration services efficiently. But scaling these services and making them affordable to low-income customers is not easy. Today, we are pleased to partner with Suyo, a social enterprise that provides tech-enabled land rights services to low-income households in Colombia, as well as several other land registration pioneers from across the world, whom I, whom I will introduce in a moment, for an online event to discuss the following two questions. First, how can organizations remove the barriers to scaling fee-based, demand-driven property registration? And second, how can they build innovative financing models that can make this service accessible for low-income customers. We'll start with a brief presentation from Matt Alexander, co-founder of Suyo, who will introduce a first-of-its-kind study that Suyo has just released with Measurement Matters, looking back at five years of Suyo's experimentation with the two questions I just mentioned. I encourage everyone to take a look at this report, uh, which is available on our website. After Matt's presentation, we will jump into a moderated panel discussion with several other land rights organizations around the world, and then we will open it up to audience Q&A. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Yulia, and thank you, New America, for putting this event on. Getting this group together is something we've wanted to do for a very long time. Uh, we deeply admire the work of all the organizations here. And there's so much collective wisdom in this virtual room that um, I, for one, want to get to the panel discussion as soon as possible. But to help frame the conversation, we thought it would be useful to share a bit more information on the precursor to this event, which was an in-depth learning study on five years of studio operations carried out by the Colombian research firm Measurement Matters. Um, before I get to a few of those general conclusions from the study, I wanted to share a bit more about who we are and why we built Suyo. So Suyo is a social enterprise that unlocks the value of low-income families' homes with property formalization technology and services. And one of our primary business lines from the beginning, when we founded Suyo in 2014 in Colombia, has been a fee-for-service offer to low-income families. Next slide, please. We started Suyo initially because our founding team had worked with victims of armed conflict in Colombia and witnessed firsthand the link between informal property and the armed conflict. But as we learned about property informality more generally, we were also frustrated, as many of the people here today are, with the magnitude of this unsolved problem. Over 50% of homes in Latin America have some degree of informality. And we know of regions and municipalities where that statistic is well over 90%. Uh, these percentages hold across the majority of the world. So this is really an all hands on deck problem to tackle. In addition to the sheer magnitude of the problem, we were intrigued by the nuances of informality. It's a problem that has a lot of variability and data sources. And we thought it was a sector that was ripe for a technology driven social enterprise approach. We went on to find in our early market research that low-income families were not only willing to pay for formalization, but they had been paying to attempt to formalize property for decades through informal middlemen and independent lawyers and other professionals, which is part of what led us to a fee-for-service model. Next slide, please. Now, we knew that a variety of property formalization services would be needed. Um, but we soon learned that that full map of services related to formalization was far bigger than we had anticipated. This slide just gives you a glimpse of what our service portfolio looks like today. 
We currently offer nine different legal and structural formalization services with 98 different variations. So standardizing these processes in a user-friendly way for low-income customers was clearly one of our first big challenges. Next slide, please. Second, local government and national government are a partner for us and they're also a provider um, as we cannot deliver property formalization services without them being able to process the claims that we make on the, on the back end of the service. Um, so a second major challenge we faced is understanding the bureaucracy behind those service services and at least partially automating the navigation of all of these formats, data sources, um, and, and different processes that the government is carrying out. Our end goal has been to convert this very complex bureaucracy into um, an easy to understand diagnostic where we can tell the low income customer what's the situation with their property, what do they, what do they need to finalize, and what are the potential financing sources that could help them pay for that service. Um, and also then once low-income families are interested in the service, being able to process uh, formalization services in an end-to-end -end manner. Next slide, please. We have had experience over the past six years delivering these services in a diverse range of geographies, um, 11 different provinces in Colombia, the Capital District, and 81 municipalities. And each of those regions have their own specific context and, and cultural norms. Next slide, please. And our focus has been um, primarily on low-income families and families living in poverty. So over 97% of our customers have been low-income and 55% come from the lowest socioeconomic stratum in Colombia. So I think this begins to paint the picture of the monumental challenge of scaling demand-driven property formalization services entails standardizing a range of legal and structural services, navigating the complex bureaucracies of our government partners and providers. Um, but it also requires selling the service to a low income segment that has limited information on these complexities. So needless to say, things did not work out exactly as we had envisioned. We experienced numerous iterations to our business model and despite very significant growth in recent years, we were never, never able to scale a model that was exclusively focused on a fee-for-service offer to low-income customers. However, the lessons we learned have the potential to advance our collective knowledge in the space and, and the innovations required. And that's what's led us to this uh, learning study. Next slide, please. We don't have time here to go into a lot of the details of the study. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. Uh, as Yulia noted, it's on the New America site. Um, it's 39 pages of qualitative and quantitative analysis by Measurement Matters, looking at four areas of our experience, sales and service execution, customer willingness to pay, government relations, and impact. Um, and for now, I would wanted to share three general takeaways from that study that hopefully serve as a takeoff point for our panel discussion today. Next slide, please. The first takeaway that we found was that frequency and type of communication are critical for acquiring and retaining customers. There are two reasons behind this. Um, you can imagine if we are still here today debating and analyzing formalization, the formalization process itself, and potential benefits of different formalization services, families naturally have some confusion over what services they need to solve this problem and the specific benefits that will follow. And second, communication is especially critical with this segment of the population because the study found that customers were really wary of new providers um, because their money and our information had been stolen in the past by informal providers. So one of the key challenges of this work is overcoming a trust barrier and clarifying the process and benefits of formalization through communic communication strategies with customers. And at Suyo, we still haven't fully succeeded at this uh, to be transparent. And a lot of this comes out in the study. 
We did major reworks of property diagnostic formats and the language in those diagnostics at least seven different times over the course of our development. And we were constantly making minor adjustments throughout our history. We knew that it was going to be hard for customers to understand what services were needed and what benefits came from those services. So we spent a lot of time, almost on a daily basis, on trying to tweak the language in a way that was easy to understand. But despite those on ongoing adjustments, the study found that 34% of our past customers surveyed said that our di diagnostic did not improve their understanding of the service. And in the study, it was also clear that the relationship between knowledge of benefits, desire to formalize, and additional actions taken to formalize was significant. On average, for for each extra benefit known, a customer was 7.4% more likely to make additional efforts to formalize their property. And those that had a positive change in desire to formalize their property were 20% more likely to make additional efforts to formalize. The second general finding is that impact varies with the services offered and degree of formalization, making communication of the benefits, the first point, a more formidable challenge. So not only do we have this wide range of complex services to deliver formalization, but the benefits for each of those services are slightly different and can vary under different contexts. So the study looked at percentage of customers experiencing positive change across 14 hypothesized outcomes. And for example, when we took one group of our formalization services, we found that reduction in family conflict was the strongest impact. Um, but when we took another specific service that had a different um, degree of formalization in the outcome, we found that improvement in home conditions and increased property values uh, were the most significant impacts. So with such a broad range of property formalization service and context, there's still work to be done to pinpoint the benefits of each service and subservice under different contexts and then be able to clearly communicate those specific benefits to customers. The third general takeaway was that the relationship among service price, willingness to pay, and capacity to pay indicates that we still have a lot of work to do to establish more flexible financing mechanisms and partial subsidies. Willingness to pay is stronger than many would assume for this low-income segment. In our case, 50% of customers were willing to pay up to 525 dollars approximately, uh, and 84% were willing to pay up to 260 US dollars, um, according to the willingness to pay surveys and study. Um, and all there, although there's a lot of variability of the prices with such a large portfolio of formalization services, this willingness to pay aligns pretty well with a good portion of the service prices. However, the study found that the average capacity to pay what was financially feasible for people to pay was only $70. Um, and this aligns with what we found in the field. Uh, we knew that beyond the trust barrier and communication barrier, that one of the significant barriers from scale that we faced over and over again was the ability to finance these services for people who wanted them. And we partnered with organizations such as Omidyar Network and Mercy Corps and a local partner, Credit Orbe, and these partners structured um, a highly innovative and really bold financing facility, a loan facility to help customers pay for formalization services. Um, but even with those adjustments, we still found that a lot of these low-income customers needed at least a partial subsidy for us to really scale the service up. Um, so the main conclusion here is that we need more aggressive innovation on the financing side. Uh, that loan facility, which is outlined in detail in brief number two from New America in the briefer series, um, was, was a big first step. And, and the partners there took a lot of risk to try and understand better how um, we can finance these services for low-income families. Uh, the eventual solution most likely entails some form of more efficient blending of government resources, private sector contributions, loans, and payments out of pockets from families. And we're excited to hear from the participants today on their experimentation and what they've learned so we can continue to advance knowledge in this field. With that, I will pass it back to Yulia. Thank you again for your time. And if you're curious to learn more about uh, the study as well as the uh, briefer series that Matt mentioned uh, on your 
uh, webinar home screen, you should see a button that will allow you to click, click through to a uh, three-part briefer series that uh, New America just released called Innovations in Financing Demand-Driven Property Registration. Uh, those briefs uh, introduce uh, this issue, uh, the second brief focuses specifically on financing models, and the third explores these concepts of willingness to pay and capacity to pay that Matt mentioned. Uh, and that same homepage will uh, also link to the studio report uh, so that you can uh, read it in depth. So with that, we will uh, turn to the uh, panel portion of our discussion. And as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, there are several pioneering organizations around the world that are experimenting with different ways to deliver uh, property registration and formalization and mediation services and how to fund those services. So we're really pleased uh, to be joined uh, in addition to SUYO by four other organizations today. Uh, this slide uh, briefly uh, outlines uh, the four organizations, uh, basic service offerings, but of course we'll hear from uh, the leaders themselves. So uh, I'll introduce the panelists. Um, first, we have Mustafa Issa, who is the executive director of the LTA NGO working in Tanzania. We're also joined by Anthony Piascovi, senior director of CADASTA. Natalie uh, Buitrago, Chief Program Officer for SUYO. Joseph Okieri, the Managing Director for Meridia in Ghana. And finally, Leonardo Gianotti, Board Member of Terra Nova in Brazil. Uh, so with that, I will um, open it up to the panelists and we would love for each of you uh, to please just take a minute or two to provide a, a brief overview of the service your organization provides, who your client is, and in particular, the payment model that your organization is using. Um, and we can go in that order, um, Mustafa, Anthony, Natalie, Joe, and Leonardo. Thank you, Nuria. My name is Mustafa. Uh, I think you can hear me. Uh, of course, the, I'm the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of the Tanzania Land Tenure Assistant. This is the local NGO registered in Tanzania, and this is the NGO uh, that offshoot of the Feed the Future USA Land Tenure Activity, which was implemented for six years in Tanzania from 2015 in the the project, of course, concluded last year, 2021. And the principle, of course, for the establishment of the uh, local NGO was to ensure the continuity uh, and the sustainability of the USA invested, of course, uh, in terms of the land tenure in Tanzania. And the key objective, of course, was uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we use land tenure as insecurity for customer village land. Uh, and also to lay the groundwork for sustainable agriculture investment for both, you know, the, the farmers and also commercial investors. And uh, as LTA NGO, uh, our service, of course, is to provide service on uh, village land registration, uh, public outreach awareness and campaign on land rights, uh, building the capacity of the local government, uh, private sector, uh, and also academia on uh, land tenure activities. Uh, we also uh, do la 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 laser awareness on MAST technology. We are also advocating on uh, mobile application to secure MAST, which was introduced uh, back in 2015 in, 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 by, by USA. We also doing the legalizing urban land. We also doing the village land use planning and climate change. Uh, our clients are the government of Tanzania, uh, donors and other implementing partners, of course, who are doing uh, land registration activities in Tanzania. And uh, uh, the mode, of course, now we are implementing, we call uh, beneficiary contribution. Uh, of course, this is the model which involves the uh, villagers uh, to contribute for their land registration activities. The model was introduced in the uh, phase two of the extension of the USA funded project. Uh, and uh, of course, it is aimed for the sustainability, of course, when USAID conclude their activities, of course, their support, you know, the villagers, are they willing to contribute uh, to fund for their land registration? So 
uh, we introduced the model uh, in 70 villages, uh, but we start with the government of Tanzania through the Minister of Land to get the acceptance and the approval, you know, if we can do land registration by the villagers, of course, to contribute, you know, the villagers they've been receiving, you know, uh, this kind of service for free, you know, we defeat, of course, implemented for almost four for, 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 for years, USA, of course, almost six years. So, you know, the first, of course, we need to get the acceptance on a negotiation, of course, on what should be charged, you know, to the villagers. So uh, we came with the idea by you know, introducing uh, the uh, fee for land registration. And this, of course, we categorize depending on the uh, size of land. Uh, and uh, we, uh, what, we, what we decided for the land uh, from zero to 10 acre, we charge Tanzania shilling 30,000, which is equivalent to $23 uh, for, this, uh, el uh, for the land uh, between 10 to 50 acres. Uh, we are charging it $26, which is equivalent to $60,000 uh, Tanzania shillings. And also for the land, of course, uh, above 50 acres, we are charging uh, $120,000 Tanzania shillings. Uh, we introduced the model in 70 villages uh, across uh, different regions, including Iringa, uh, uh, Mbea, uh, of course, and Jombe. Uh, and the out of the 70 villages, of course, you know, we are just starting. So we have managed to successfully implement in 24 villages. And uh, the, uh, the program, of course, is on progress now. We are uh, introducing model in other regions also. So and of course, we have managed to contribute around, uh, I think, over 200,000 uh, uh, USD uh, from the villages. To, and this, of course, it's only covering the direct cost of the implementation. This including uh, verification of the village boundaries, uh, land use planning uh, process, awareness campaign to the, village, to the villages, uh, demarcation and adjudication using mobile application, must uh, 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 procurement of stationaries, payment of the uh, district of, uh, officials and also the program officials when they are conducting field acti activities, uh, procurement of the stationary required for uh, preparing the certificates, the, the CCROs. Uh, so those are the specifically costs associated uh, for the implementation. So, and of course it was accepted. The villagers are contributing, the demand is high. And now of course we are trying to expand ourselves beyond you know, what we have started uh, uh, moving forward. Thank uh, you, thanks. Mustafa. Thank you so much, Mustafa. And we'll move on uh, to uh, Anthony. Uh, and if we can uh, just keep the, uh, this first response to a minute or two, we have uh, so many questions already coming in from the audience, so I'm eager to get to those. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Yulia. Thank you also to New America and to Suyo. Uh, my name is Tony Piascovi, or Anthony, um, and I work at Cadasta Foundation, where I'm the Senior Director of Operations and Program Impact. And Cadasta is, uh, is an international NGO. We provide uh, web-based GIS mapping and land information management tools with mobile data collection capabilities. Um, our primary clients are um, uh, community-based uh, NGOs and international NGOs, as well as governments. I should add both national and sub-level, uh, sub-national governments. Uh, we work in, a, in 42 countries currently and have helped increase tenure security for more than 5 million people living on almost 20 million hectares. Um, more than uh, 250,000 um, um, type of document or formalization has been um, issued to those, um, those households and, and those um, to those households. And last year, we moved to a fee for service model that um, asks partners to pay for a bundle of services that meet their needs. And we have three basic plan levels with customization options. I'll leave it at that for now and turn it over uh, back to you. Thanks, Tony. Over to you, Natalie. Uh, I know Matt already gave a, a presentation on Suyo's work, but if you could just briefly recap those three. Uh, questions, the service, the client, and the payment model, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, I'm Natalie Huitrago. I'm the, um, the 
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm the Chief Program Officer. And uh, basically, uh, I'm going to summarize what Matt said. Uh, we're a public benefit company that provides property formalization services to low income families. First, we do uh, a property diagnostic where we uh, uh, define what's the formalization service that must be undertaken. And then uh, we carry out that formalization pro uh, process. Um, for the payment model, we use a blended mechanism. So we use customers own existing resources, but as Matt also told, we use a subsidy or a financing from private companies that we have as partners or mix financing options. Fantastic, thank you, Nathalie. Uh, Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. Julia and uh, good afternoon, new Americans. I'm actually the MD for Meridia, Ghana. Uh, Meridia is a land rights documentation company. Um, we've been operating in Ghana for almost seven years. Um, our services are very interesting and sensitive, just as other services relating to land. So Meridia provides survey services, as well as collecting legal data that prepares documents to protect our clients' interests. So um, we provide both land tenure services, as well as free tenure for registration of tree services in Ghana, not just for farmers alone, but for residential uh, owners. But um, our main client has been farmers and our focus has been on cocoa farmers. Cocoa farmers because we realize that these farmers have entered into various form of contractual ag agreements with their landlords, um, which initially was working well, but over time is becoming challenging for all these farmers to rehabilitate their farms. In Ghana, there's an arrangement called Abunu, which is share cropping arrangement where an individual can enter into arrangement with a landlord, cultivate the land. When the crops mature, then the farm is shared into two. In fact, I said this farm, not the land. Some people claim that it's a land they share, but technically it is the farm. So what it means is that once the farm um, exits or the trees exit the land, the land must revert back to the original owner. So some of these farmers are not prepared to cut the, 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 the trees, even when they are moribund, they are diseased, and they are not fruiting. Because once the, the tree is in the land, the land reverts to the original owner. So Meridia's um, service is to find innovative ways, not just protecting the rights of the land owners and the landholders, how these farmers can also enter into proper leases arrangements with these landlords for a specific period of time so that they can stay on the land for that period of time to benefit the farmers and for the landlords to also benefit equally. Um, our payment, we are for social impact, but for profit company. From the one, we work for profit, but um, our model has been um, structuring the payment around economy of scale where the numbers determine the price we charge our clients. But we believe that um, if you move to a community and you are attending to five people, you can charge another community that you are attending to over 20 people. And then um, these clients uh, or farmers uh, have interesting dynamics, which share similarities with the survey that was shared by Sue. So we'll touch on that later on. And then we deal a lot with what we call traditional authorities because in Ghana, lands are being held when it comes to management. It's only transferred to the, the, the government when one decides to title it. So our main services is leveraging technology and making sure our fam families receive lowest possible uh, land tenure documentation service as much as possible and at the same time uh, encouraging corporate institutions 
the LBCs or companies that benefit from cocoa and these crops we deal with contribute or subsidize uh, for the benefits of themselves and the farmers as well. I think I will be here for now. If there are other questions, then uh, I will jump in the key. Thank you, Joe. And finally, uh, turning it over to Leonardo. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you, listening to your experiences, and it's so inspirational. So we are in Tehanova, we mediate conflicts uh, between uh, the, the landowners that own the land and the people that occupy the land they, they want. Basically, our challenge is to bring the government also to the agreement, and building this agreement, our financial model is to take a stake on the stalemates that we uh, prevail in the agreement. So it's a kind of fee, but it's, uh, it based on, it's based on the payment that is done. Our challenge is that our clients, our direct clients, the occupants, they are, they, they live below the, the poverty line. So they don't have any, any credit score or they are unbankerized or uh, living in bad conditions. So our challenge, challenge is to bring the real estate framework, financial framework, in order to build installment that respect their payment capacity. What you have done with the financial market? We uh, sell the ventures in the financial market in order to uh, allow uh, a credit for all, because we cannot uh, exclude anyone from the credit and we cannot evaluate the credit individually. So we have to believe in their um, uh, uh, capacity to pay, but at the same time, we know now we have 20 years uh, of time and we have more than 36 projects, more than 30,000 families in our, in our projects. We have a uh, delinquency rate less than 1%. So we are now have an, uh, our own credit score. So our challenge is to how can we bring more money from the financial market in order to pay like uh, things like infrastructure in the short term, respecting their, their payment capacity in the long term? So that's our challenge. And uh, it's nice to be with you and answer the other questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So Joe, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, based on Meridia's experience uh, over the last seven years, do you see any discernible trends or insights on who is willing to pay and who isn't willing to pay for land documentation? We have actually been interacting with uh, very interesting and dynamic clients, the cocoa farmers especially. We have observed that most of these farmers have picked up a subculture I mean, a culture of receiving things for free. Uh, um, to some extent, the cocoa tree has become a political tree in Ghana. Government comes up with a lot of promises to these cocoa farmers, uh, giving them free fertilizers, pruning their farms for them free. So what I'm trying to say is that an attempt to provide some of these things to farmers for free, it has really gotten into their heads. And, um, most of them think that everything coming to them should be free. And then not only that, I'm just setting the base to answer your question. Not only that, most of the farmers who also are natives and hail from where they are and they got their last through customary tenure arrangement, they feel that is where they come from. If there's no commercial um, uh, value uh, being demanded from them concerning their lands, as they're going for loans, or they need to present the document for any business activity. They usually do not see the need to pay for these services as compared to the migrant farmers who have moved from one area to the other and feel that the one they move, so they need to protect their interests and leave the legacy of the property behind for their children. And what we have done is to do extensive sensitization and education on the need and the importance of why these farmers need to document their rights. And one of it is what I mentioned earlier on. The Abunu arrangement does not favor most of these farmers. So if you leave the land open, if you leave the arrangement open and there's bushfire, 
and there is disease like uh, uh, cocoa solid shoot disease, a virus. When it attacks a cocoa, it cannot easily be treated. Then you have no option than to walk away from the farm, whether you have stayed there a year or two. So when these education are done extensively for the farmers to understand, they see the value. And uh, those who have gotten some level of appreciable yield and are able to pay are always willing to contribute towards, to, towards that. Again, we are now looking into tying the payment into other incentives that check us in from the companies. We have a lot of uh, companies in the chocolate uh, uh, industry that want to give back to these farmers. So they always come up with subsidies, but um, we don't want their subsidies to contribute to what I first mentioned coming from the government. So how can we put this in the proper perspective so that it does not add on to what we're trying to cure on the ground. So it comes in in a form of, if you plant more trees and you are able to keep these trees to mature to a certain level, then you receive more from these um, subsidies. And again, uh, it is also tied to the number of beans, which most of the cocoa uh, companies call bonuses they give to these farmers. It comes in also as bonus to these farmers who have contributed uh, or sold a lot of beans to a particular uh, brand, um, brand or company. So uh, we are trying to um, touch on various uh, strategies and various education, I mean, uh, intensify sensitization and education, uh, uh, especially, especially concerned on the cocoa on the cocoa farmers. And again, concerning the the, the traditional authorities, the chiefs, who are supposed to sign up these documents, they have to sign at a fee. And if they are not willing to reduce their fees, it becomes difficult to present a reasonable price to these farmers. So we also present the data we collect in a well-organized fashion, which is the more beneficial to these chiefs as an incentive and as a, an add-on benefit. So they are willing to also reduce their fees to help present a reasonable price to these farmers. But there are other sensitivities, which uh, I'm sure if I have a chance to come in again, I will touch on, but let me leave it at this point. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. And because I know that this is a challenge that each of your organizations is uh, dealing with, uh, I just want to open it up for a very quick rapid fire round, uh, you know, 20, 30 seconds or less uh, for anybody who wants to jump in uh, with strategies that you're using to uh, convince hesitant customers to become willing to purchase uh, land registration or other land tenure services. So for anybody who wants to jump in. I could add here, it's nice to hear, Joseph, because here in Brazil, uh, basically see 20% uh, once we respect the, their payment capacity, 25% uh, are willing to pay for goodwill, for uh, asset valorization, for positive things. Uh, another 25% are not willing to pay in any scenario. They are resistant. They are against anything. They are asking to the government. They are asking for subsidies. And the, the people in the middle are listening who speak louder. You know, that's uh, something that we can... We, we need to uh, bring to some culture, education, campaign, information, clarify uh, all the points in order to bring the community to the project, to buy the project, you know, to, to enforce uh, the benefit. I think, unfortunately, it's, it's hardest for the most vulnerable communities. We, 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 we aren't reaching those that are most vulnerable in these kinds of fee-for-service um, models, you know, I think what has, has been experienced by Cadastan this last year is that we found that um, previous partners who are more familiar with the technology and have been exposed to the benefits are more likely to um, pay for them in the future. Um, partners that are resourced by donors or, or have other funding are, are, are more likely. Um, Communities or organizations that are tied to communities that have really strong social cohesion and experience with microfinancing um, schemes beforehand are more likely 
to pick this up. And then I think the last point that I would make, um, and we're seeing particularly in our work in India, is when there's a strong and well understood legal framework about formalization, for example, about forest dwelling uh, rights. Um, there is a willingness um, to pay in those scenarios because communities understand the framework that exists. It's, it's well understood, it's well established, and they know the end goal. It's very easy for them to see. And so I think those are just a handful of scenarios in which we found that there's a really strong interest. And the converse of all of those is that when those are not present, it's much harder to convince groups to pay. Um, so you, we would add for uh, that showing evidence of successful processes is vital for uh, making people to be willing to pay. So if they see family or community members close to them who has already had a process, it's, it makes them uh, be much more willing to pay for the service. Fantastic. Um, thank you, everyone. So Mustafa, I want to turn to you. Joe mentioned uh, something that I know that uh, LTA ran into in Tanzania, which is that when customers are um, or beneficiaries are accustomed to receiving the service for free, it's difficult to then ask them to pay for it. Uh, if they see that, for example, their neighbor had previously gotten uh, land registration services for free. So in your work, um, how do you uh, counteract um, this uh, or, or deal with this issue? Yeah, uh, that was challenging, of course. When we, when we introduced the model, you, you remember, of course, we like transition ourselves from uh, free service delivery to beneficial contribution. So at the beginning, it was difficult. And uh, to be frank, we tested the model in two different uh, districts. So, you know, in the district that we have implemented the service for free, you know, we, we, we struggled a little bit, of course, to get acceptance uh, from, uh, from the beneficiaries to contribute for their CCR hours. But uh, in the district that we went, we just introduced the model for the first time and they never received uh, this kind of the services for free. You know, it was, you know, the tech cup was higher and, and they are contributing and there is high demand you know, for the villagers, for the beneficiaries to contribute against their land certification. So you can see, so we invested uh, a lot, you know, in terms of public awareness campaign, radio programs, of course, to convince people, of course, now they can, you know, they can pay for their services, but it was really difficult at the beginning to be found. Yeah, thanks so much, Mustafa. Um, so I'll turn to Natalie and Leo. Uh, both Suyo and uh, Terranova have been experimenting with, um, you know, really interesting financing models that uh, try to solve this um, capacity to pay issue that Matt had described. Uh, could each of you uh, tell us a little bit um, from your work with low-income households in Colombia and Brazil uh, respectively, that may not be able to pay for the entire service up front. Um, how have your organizations uh, tried to um, solve this capacity to pay issue in your in your uh, payment model? Yes. Well, uh, as Matt told, we we moved from a B two C model to a B two B two C model, where you we have corporate partners that uh, helps financing those uh, services. So we have, a, we, they can loan to their employees or give even sometimes subsidies to the employees so that they can help uh, their employees to pay the services. But it's something really important to, to, to say is that um, in our communication strategy, strategy, we emphasize that land registration is just the last step after a family has build their own home or has bought their, their land. So it, what this shows is that the family over the time has been able to save or to invest in their homes even a little bit. So they just need that help or that push from their employees in this case by the B2B2C model where they uh, uh, help them financing or subsidizing one part of the, of the service. 
That's a, a really big challenge for us. Uh, uh, I remember when we received uh, students and a professor from Harvard to meet our case to the MBA, they asked me, you know, how is it possible? Because your client is not the best client in terms of credit. They don't have money in the short term. You have a lot of compromises in the short term. So what we invented here locally is to copy and paste the real estate framework to the regularization process especially in terms of bonds, social bonds. We, we sell the ventures. So what do I have to convince the investors? And firstly, I ask it to Omidyar, for example, because of venture philanthropy, in order to buy the first bonds to prove to the market because my client's the best client in the real estate in Brazil. The real estate in Brazil has like 5% of the liquidity rate. My client has 1% because it's the only asset they have. So they, they own, they own the, they are very committed to the payment. So once I have, I can prove that with my my first investors, I can go to the nor local market and sell a, like a market bond. With this money, I can make the compromise in the short term, uh, even protecting the payment capacity because I can use like twenty years long uh, bond, you know, and bring the money to the short term to things like infrastructure for. Sometimes the land owner uh, do, doesn't want to receive in the long term in the agreement, so I can pay in front and receive in the long term. We create a lot of mechanisms to be uh, uh, very creative. But the most important thing, uh, when I didn't um, respect the payment capacity, the delinquency rate grew. So it's not a sustainable movement in the long term. So I have in the first moment, I have to protect the payment capacity. I use uh, the local government programs here that says that we can just commit 30% of their income based on our minimal salary. So I use this movement with a lot of social assessment and build a number. So our statement installment should not be higher than like 300 highs, for example. With this number, I do some economic model to the long term and I go to the investor and say, I have a project with this financial framework. Do you pay for that? Can you buy this bond? It's a kind of, in the first time it was like love money. I was talking like Mustafa was talking to his donors. But at, in the second uh, emission, I have, more, I have more proofs. And the third mission, nowadays I have a market adjusted bond. I can even uh, fundraise a, a higher amount of money. So the challenge is how to Talk to the real estate market framework uh, using to my client because my client is not a, a, a normal client to the real estate. So nowadays, uh, Brazilian fintechs, for example, Nubank and other fintechs, they're bringing um, uh, banking service to these clients. So it's getting easier to convince them to commit in the long term with the installments. Thank you, Bob. Um, Tony, turning to you, um, Cadasta's platform is a little bit different because it's marketed uh, more so towards um, nonprofits and uh, organizations as opposed to individual households. Um, how does this customer profile inform Cadasta's exploration of fee for service business models? Thanks, Celia. I think interestingly, we um, experienced some of the same things that Matt um, um, outlined in his presentation, um, interestingly enough. I mean, I think the first thing is that with a varied set of customers, even differences between governments, INGOs, or community-based NGOs, the, um, the payment structures and options need to be different and, and, and provide um, things that meet those specific uh, customer needs. And so, for community-based organizations, that might mean um, sliding scale for um, uh, very small grassroots organizations. Um, the second thing would be, you know, learn as you go and change and, and adapt. Um, we have had to adjust, you know, certain of the customization, uh, customized fees up or down based on the experience of, of working with new groups. And so some things become cheaper for us to do the, the more times we do it, some things we realize are more expensive and, and those adjustments get made. And then I think the point that, that Matt made and that others have made on this panel is, you know, the ability to, um, to have some um, amount of subsidization depending on, on the partner need 
is, is critical for us, even as we try to move more and more away from that. I think it's an incremental process and maybe you don't ever get rid of that, but you try to shrink it as much as, as possible. Thanks so much, Tony. And I'm seeing the audience Q&A flow in. So I'm just gonna ask our panel um, one last uh, kind of rapid fire question and then we'll move to audience questions. So uh, the last question that I would love uh, for all of you to answer briefly is, from your experience, what is the most important thing that needs to happen in order for this demand-driven, fee-based uh, land documentation model to scale and remain sustainable? I can I can start for for me I think uh, uh, if you get uh, uh, approval and acceptance from the government counterpart you know from for instance from us you know we got full support from the Minister of Lands you know full support from the district authorities at the village levels ward authorities you know you can see the deed and uh, we have established the MOU and now the government of you know of Tanzania they've requested us of course you know to give them some documentation to replicate the model and they've started to replicate the model. So you can see when you, the process is full engaged uh, from, from all levels, the acceptance and the implementation, you know, you know, it becomes smoothly and... Thank you. From our side, uh, we will say that the most important thing is uh, it would be like open data. Uh, so you face a lot of costs in terms of time also, uh, but in money uh, related to data, data is not uh, directly accessible and it costs. So uh, that's one issue that we think that would make uh, services more um, more scalable and also uh, we would say that it would be to promote registration services, culture and benefits. As Matt told, uh, told you, the willing to pay, it increases depending on how much people know about the benefits of formalization of their property. There are other things that I would say that the one that has more impact, it would be uh, having access in our case, having, having access to open data for our uh, formalization services it's the same for us natalie it's nice to to see you mention that because like impact measure measurement is a, a great tool here because when you uh, show the positive externalities from the formalization from the regularization inspire more communities to uh, jump in in a new project so you have to spread the news you know and uh, for, for us it's a great challenge because the government still in brazil offers things for free so we are uh, every day fighting this 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 this, this speech, you know. So my 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 dream here is to build to build an infrastructure, to build a framework that the, the communities can do the regularization by they themselves, you know. I would agree with that, and I would also just add that I think that um, uh, demonstrating impact. Um, is, is relevant not just for projects where formalization is the end goal, but when um, there's an incremental or a less formal approach as well. Yes, then um, to add to what um, has been said, Meridian, um, we have been comes to our next, the ch biggest challenge is to get subsidies, well-structured subsidies, as I mentioned earlier. We don't believe, we don't believe in give, giving services to these farmers for free, but because of where they've been in the culture, we have to strategically and gradually move them and contribute to the challenge on the ground. And again, the service is such that it's, it's so expensive if you have to attend to a few people. So the subsidies comes in as a, as a mean handy. So you can attend to a lot of people, a lot of farmers, all in the same community. If you move to one farm to map, 
then you come back to our base to go back and map. Of course, the mobilization costs will go to the individuals, but if you have a number of them at a time who, because of the subsidy, cannot sign on, it becomes cheaper and easier to, to work. So um, we are we are still asking for what we are preaching against. <laughs> we really want the farmers to pay in full, but at the same time, we have to build them up and bring them along the line um, over time. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And um, there are several audience questions that sort of dig in a little bit deeper on this question of sustainability and scaling uh, that I'll get to in a second. Um, but I'd like to direct the first um, audience question uh, to uh, two questions, actually, uh, to Matt and Nathalie, uh, going off of um, Matt's presentation. Um, the two questions are, um, first, does Suyu have any takeaways regarding uh, the retaining of formalization. So uh, by I'm interpreting that to mean sort of once the first registration is completed, how willing are clients to maintain that, for example, if transactions occur. And then the second one relates to government fee fees in Colombia and whether there has been any discussion, for example, of uh, the government reducing its fees uh, since those account for um, a good portion of uh, the fee then charged to the consumer. Maybe I'll take the first one and then Natalie can take the second. Um, we, we have certainly seen once we have a, a customer that there is um, an interest in maintaining that formalization and it, 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 it's was part of our vision starting out was that if we can overcome that trust barrier and a customer can go through one of those formalization services with us and improve their tenure security, that they will then know that they have a trusted provider and their money or data won't be stolen. And they'll know that it's you know within reach with the different financing mechanisms and they'll continue to formalize over time. Um, we've seen repeat customers uh, as everyone knows, the property is constantly changing. And, and this was, I, th I think, one of our concerns, seeing experiences from the past when a lot of resources are spent on titling a community, and then you go back to that community years later, and it's all informal again, because the incentives and the providers and the structures weren't set up for people to maintain formality over time. Um, so we have some anecdotal evidence that that does occur. But um, it, we, we face the same challenges that we're talking about here, right? I, I think when we have at least one customer that's done some aspect of formalization with a, a trustworthy provider, whether it be Suyo or uh, a, a partnership with government or NGOs or others, um, that's going to at least help you get over that initial trust barrier. But there's still the financing barrier. Um, and, and so a lot of these innovations that we're looking at financing also apply to those repeat customers that may have initially titled the land. Now they want to register the building or they want to subdivide or they want to sell a portion of the building. And they're going to need for that service to be accessible uh, to be able to maintain formalization. And, and, it, and most importantly, enjoy all of the benefits come, that come with a more complete uh, uh, formalization um, profile for that, for that property. Um, you mentioned government fees. As we've, we've seen in the study and we've seen over and over again, it's a big part of our costs. Um, we, on three of the five general categories for um, property formalization services, 45% or more of our costs are related to government fees. Um, but there are a lot of efforts that are taking place. Um, there's different levels of information on, on those efforts. And, and we also see um, some entities, local government, maybe not being totally aware of, of some of those discounts that exist. But I, I think Natalie would probably have more up-to-date information on the latest efforts to reduce those fees in Colombia. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, uh, I would say that the efforts are more focused on government uh, formalization process. I mean, when the government is the one that offers ma massive land title process, you, you don't have those fees, but for on-demand formalization, it's a different, it's like we still don't have a public policy that is focused on on-demand formalization or, or re registration uh, land policies. We don't have that. So 
uh, most of the fees or where you don't have fees, it's focused on those uh, massive land title uh, process that governments have. So that's that's a really that's a big issue here uh, here in Colombia. But it's because the public policy is destined to have these massive government uh, processes instead of on demand uh, driven formalization. Thanks, Natalie and Matt. And um, speaking of government, um, I'm hoping that um, each of the panelists uh, could answer this question uh, briefly. Can you speak to the challenges of aligning your services with government systems, uh, which may, for example, see you as a competitor, or uh, there may be you know, questions of legitimacy? Um, uh, put differently, how, how do you make sure to work with government, or do you? It's a constant. Uh, it's a constant challenge here because sometimes we're having a federal level. For example, in Brazil, we have a left side government that empowers the community, and then suddenly they change for a right, a right left, uh, a right wing government that doesn't believe on local associations, uh, but also believe on private companies trying to solve problems. So uh, here we are always trying to uh, uh, build a good relationship with local government, federal government, in order to uh, firstly, uh, to have a high level compliance in terms of uh, urbanism, uh, architecture, and all the local laws. And second, to bring all the contribution we can, we can have from the government, because they are the most important player in regularization, especially in, here in Brazil. So it's, uh, is a, a, a very close relationship, but with a lot of conflicts in the journey. But uh, we have to solve those small, it's a small conflict. Like we have a local entity that sees us as a competitor. So have to talk with them, try to collaborate, and, and at the same time to try to build legal frameworks in a federal level that uh, allows our work locally. So it's a, is, um, we have a special uh, person in the company, just focus on that. I think in our work with governments, we have, we've had to make sure that we are providing something, whether it be technology or um, um, some new type of benefit that the government currently um, is unable to do for whatever reason. Um, and I think in one of those cases, and I'm seeing a lot of donors move towards this, and we are working um, um, on a project in Haiti that really combines or recognizes that um, the, a set of land information is really um, the, the, the building block or uh, the first step in actually um, a government having the information set that they need to roll out resource mobilization. And so you're seeing projects that tie, you know, increasing tenure security and formalization to resource mobilization. And that I think unlocks some capabilities of governments to do more um, to, you know, in essence fund part of the, um, you know, uh, formalization, the land formalization um, processes or steps, but then also unlock other services. And when you can present solutions that, um, that provide those type of benefits, then I think it becomes more, more and more attractive. Um, uh, from our perspective, we think that uh, we're moving from a relationship where the go where government and, and, and so your other companies is like contractor service provider. We're moving to a more, uh, of uh, public-private uh, relationships. Um, we have an example here that it's a um, Land for Prosperity, which is a program that, that tries to do that, to, to see the government and private companies working more together rather than having a hierarchical uh, relationship. And we have other, other things going on, such as that now in Colombia, you have the cadaster as a public service that can be provided by private, private companies which opens um, the length of, of working of, of, of companies like, like Suyo. Um, 
And the other relationship that we have in the other hand, it has to do with uh, the government as a provider of information. And this is really, really important that we need to work in. How the government can like uh, be the center to, to give all the information for on-demand driven formalization to be, to be done. Great. Um... Thanks, just checking whether Mustafa or Joe want to field this question. If not, I'll move uh, on to the next one. Okay, so um, I have to go off because my internet was uh, go off the video. For Meridia, uh, services actually complement the services of the government. In Ghana, only the Lands Commission had the mandate to issue title. And we are actually providing documentations that will ready the farmers to some extent for the tiling process if um, the farmers desire to go for tiling at all. So there's no, um, they're only complementing the efforts and trying to also share the data we collect with one of the government agencies called Office of the Administrator of Two Lands that is responsible for collecting land tribute, that is taxes from farmers who are on certain type of lands. So the data we collect comes in handy for them to be able to determine the sizes these farmers occupy. And here too, the officers on the ground just estimate what, 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 what the farmers occupy and then negotiate for them as what to pay. So we're trying to also bring some form of sanity and clarity in, in that in that sector, and the government has really been supportive uh, in terms of provision of our services, even though we have some technical challenges with regards to the survey requirements, which are uh, which still has a lot of um, uh, complications that has to be looked at and uh, clarified and simplified. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I think, um, hello? We can hear you. Ah, okay, thank you, my, my internet, of course. So, of course, in Tanzania, the same, you know, we are providing the services that the government are providing, you know, at all level, from the national level to the district level. The only issue from our side is the cost, of course. We are transparent. We provide, of course, how much we can, you know, for instance, maybe land registration can cost. And the government, of course, they are doing the same with the different budgets. So sometimes there is an issue of, you know, the budget issues. The government asks, why are you doing this cheaply? You know, why do our budget is this way? So those are the issues the, the issue that, of course, we are challenging us during the implementation. But the advantage is, of course, we, we will make sure that wherever we, we have listened, the must uh, technology which we introduce, of course, it is in line with the government registration and procedures. So, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are on the same page. That's why they accept it. But the issue is, you know, to be transparent on how much it costs, you know, to do the registration, of course. So that's the issue. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mustafa. So uh, our final question, uh, uh, again, to the group, uh, we have four minutes left. So uh, uh, again, a rapid fire question. Um, many of you have noted that you're working, you know, your customer isn't necessarily the uh, smallholder farmer or the individual landholder. You're working with uh, flower companies or cocoa companies or in Cadastas case with NGOs and so on. So the question is, um, in, in order to scale, who will be your payer at scale? Um, and what percentage of your total business do you feel would need to be um, subsidized by this player in order for it to be uh, successful? I mean, I'll go first. I think for Cadasta, it's a combination of um, uh, donor funded um, NGO work. So, you know, funding not directly from, from donors, but working with NGOs who are being funded by donors. Um, and then also, you know, communities and community-based organizations that have mobilized in a way to, um, to um, you know, raise funds locally or, or to tap into those donor funds. And I think that probably, you know, I uh, indicated or I mentioned earlier, we wanna try to get that as large as possible. I don't think it's, it, 
Ideally, yes, it would be 100%, but I think, you know, it, it, it won't always be that. And so there's going to be a sliver that needs to be, you know, some kind of unrestricted foundation or, you know, private donor that, that's funding that, that small, hopefully small, small other piece. Yeah, from from uh, from my side, uh, typically, of course, what we are collecting from the villagers is for the uh, dialect cost. You know, it covers only the cost for the field operations. You know, so you know, for, for we are struggling, of course, to you know, to get the uh, the fund for the operation cost. Yeah, but you know, what we are collecting from the uh, from the villagers can hundred percent deliver what the villagers need. Of course, they can provide their certification. But of course, the question of course remains, of course, on how we can get, you know, you know, the cost for the operation, the salaries for the staff and, and everything. So, you know, we are struggling, of course, to approach different donors, at least to contribute some amount. And then, you know, the remaining balance, of course, can be covered by the villager itself. Um, similarly for us, uh, we think it's a combination of actors, and I think it's not as much a, a question of one particular actor that's going to help us get over the hump, but, but a more efficient allocation of resources, existing resources that are out there, uh, government resources, corporate resources. We've worked with a lot of employers who are interested in financing formalization for low-income uh, customers or suppliers or employees, um, and payment out of pocket from those families that are benefiting, as well as financing and loans that help them uh, maybe fill that gap. So with the property diagnostic that we do, which was originally designed to identify the needs of the property, the path to formalization, we've been doing a lot of experimentation on how can we rapidly assess by each customer what they can pay out of pocket, what they can finance, and then how do we fill that gap with government and corporate resources um, so we have somewhat of a personalized approach uh, to the blended financing. Here we're using um, this the, this money for to prove that a new a new city and a new payer is a good payer. So you, you buy the first risk we call here. You you should buy the first risk and prove to the market that we have a, a market just a, a payer. So it's very useful. Yeah, I think um, it's a combination of all that has been said. So for, for us, we think the, the, the industry that benefit from the cocoa um, also to some extent benefit from the work we do, because they also try on the data we share, helping the farmers to produce more and have more yield. So you think that the subsidies from the industry will be great to help move the farmers from uh, these freebies and then to fully uh, uh, sensitize them to take care of, of, of the fees for the services. And then, I mean, donors that are interested in the sector. So the combination of the three, the industry donors and the farmers themselves, we believe that the farmers have to contribute no matter what the subsidies are so that the, the, the sense of belonging, the sense of ownership of the document and the culture of the freebies can be um, Thank you. Well, with that, I'd like to wrap up today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists uh, for participating and uh, sharing candidly uh, some of the challenges that you're working through in this, um, you know, extremely uh, new and difficult uh, market uh, to deliver a much needed service uh, to uh, you know billions of people. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for tuning in. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar up on YouTube in the coming days, and uh, it'll also be out in our monthly newsletter that's being sent out tomorrow. So with that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>